Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lucy Winkett. I'm the rector here at St. James's Church, Piccadilly, and it's simply my duty to welcome you here tonight and to say how honored we are to be hosting this concert for you this evening. I know that you're going to have a wonderful evening of extraordinary music, but I also wanted just to say a word of welcome and to put uh, this concert, in a sense, in the context of this historic place. You're sitting in a building that was consecrated in 1684 and designed by Sir Christopher Wren. And one of the key features of this building, as you listen to the music you can look around, is that there is clear glass, not stained glass, throughout the building. This is because Christopher Wren wanted the light of reason to shine on the practice of religion. And for people who gathered in a holy and sacred and beautiful place like this, to be able to see out and for others to be able to see in. So the architecture itself speaks of events that are connected with the world as it is, and a statement of hope that the world could be better than it is. So we hope that you enjoy the concert tonight. We're honored to be able to help to raise funds for this vital work in Afghanistan itself. And if you happen to, after you have donated uh, for this concert, if you happen to want to help us continue to host events like this, we have just launched a campaign to be able to restore this church for decades to come. So I won't say too much about that. You're here to raise money for other things. But if you would like to help us, do go to our website and see that. But my main task is to say you are very welcome wherever you've traveled from today. The past months have been very difficult for all of us. And so we are really delighted that you're here. Have a fantastic evening. And can I hand you over to your host for this evening, John Suchet. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you for allowing us to use your beautiful church for tonight's concert. And may I just say what a pleasure it is on behalf of all the musicians to see a real live audience. It is such a lovely thing to see. And I can assure you they are as thrilled to play for you as you are to hear them. Now, Good evening to you in this beautiful church and indeed to all our viewers and listeners on the internet, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our very special concert for Afghanistan. And as Lucy said, tonight's concert is a means of reminding ourselves that nothing is stronger in the world than love and compassion. And nothing, no language, no book, no piece of art conveys love and compassion more universally than music. Music is the only language that the entire world understands. It transcends words, it transcends politics, it transcends religion. It is, in all its myriad and miraculous forms, the language of every single human being. In Afghanistan, music stands on the edge of silence. Radios play no music. There is no music at parties. There is no music at weddings. Hundreds of musicians have gone into hiding. Many more have fled the country. Musical instruments are hidden in cupboards or under floorboards. Those that are found are destroyed. In Kabul, the Afghan women's orchestra, Zohra, named after the Persian goddess of music, Zohra, the country's first all-female orchestra, is silent. On the 14th of August, they were rehearsing for an upcoming performance. One day later, Kabul fell to the Taliban. The joyful expression of the most universal language of all is forbidden. And so tonight, we will make music for the people of Afghanistan on behalf of those musicians of Afghanistan. Our very special orchestra tonight is made up of some of this country's finest orchestral players and they represent all British musicians and their solidarity with Afghan musicians and Afghan people. And the orchestra will begin the concert tonight with a piece of music specially written for this concert. So this is its world premiere. 
Debbie Wiseman, who I'm proud to say is Classic FM's composer in residence, has written this composition called simply To Help. To conduct, please welcome David Murphy.
was Debbie Wiseman's new composition to help specially commissioned for tonight's concert for Afghanistan and thus heard here tonight for the first time, David Murphy conducting. Welcome to our Concert for Afghanistan. And I want now to talk about a truly remarkable man. Dr. Ahmad Sarmast founded the Afghan National Institute of Music in 2010, the building that housed a talented generation of young musicians is now a military base for extreme militants. A third of the music students have managed to flee their country. Many others are in hiding. Dr. Sarmast himself has left Afghanistan. With so many still in Afghanistan, it is tempting to say that those who have managed to leave are fortunate. To be forced to leave your country because you are a musician how can that be fortunate, and how can that happen in the 21st century? In 2014, Dr. Sarmast held a concert of his talented students. The Taliban sent a suicide bomber. The bomber and a member of the audience were killed. Dr. Sarmast was injured and lost some of his hearing. From his place of exile, Dr. Sarmast has sent us a message. This message vividly describing the plight of musicians in Afghanistan. From my perspective, this concert and the musician participating in this concert, people who, who will be attending this concert and people who will be donating to the cause, it is a solidarity with Afghan music. It's a solidarity with Afghan musician. It, it's a solidarity with the Afghan people. It sends a strong message that the people of Afghanistan are not al uh, alone in their struggle to get their rights back. Right to have access to musical languages is not existing anymore in Afghanistan. Rights mm -hmm. to practice, to be involved in music making, it does not exist anymore in Afghanistan. Rights to express yourself freely and fairly to music is not available the, to my people anymore. Rights to make a living through music this is denied. Afghan musicians are denied this right. And rights to have all the facilities and all means to share your skills and your art with the rest of the community. It's taken away from the Afghan musicians. If we all truly believe that music is a universal language, help us today, save us today, so we can right. raise our voices again tomorrow. truly believe that music is a universal language. Help us today, save us today, so we can raise our voices again tomorrow. The words of the leading music educator in Afghanistan, Dr. Ahmad Samast, giving true meaning to our concert here tonight. And so to our second piece of music, the Concerto for Oboe and Violin by Johann Sebastian Bach. The oboe is an instrument that originated in the Middle East. That clear, bright sound is redolent with images of the Near Orient and South Asia. I'm delighted to say that our soloists tonight are two of the most highly respected instrumentalists on the world stage. To play Bach's Concerto for Oboe and Violin, please welcome Nicholas Daniel and Alina Ibragimova.
What a truly wonderful performance, the sheer energy in that. Alina Ibrahimova and Nicholas Daniel, the soloists, in Bach's Concerto for Violin and Oboe. And a warm welcome once again from me, John Suchet, to our concert for Afghanistan, sending a clear message to the musicians of Afghanistan that we support you. And we hope, with your help, wherever you are watching this concert, we hope to raise much needed funds to support the aid effort in Afghanistan. All funds raised through tonight's concert will go to the International Rescue Committee, which is doing vital work on the ground in Afghanistan. And we now have this statement from their CEO, David Miliband, followed by the voices of the girls of Afghanistan. Hi, I'm David Miliband, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. I'm incredibly grateful to all of you, whether you've joined in person at St. James's or online, for being part of this remarkable and special concert. The International Rescue Committee has worked in Afghanistan since 1988, and our 1,700 staff on the ground are determined to carry on serving the Afghan people. Our priorities at the moment are in healthcare, in cash assistance, in education, and in protection for women and children, especially girls. We know that this trauma that the Afghan people are facing is not confined to those within Afghanistan. We're supporting Afghans who have fled to Mexico, to Uganda, and as the largest refugee resettlement agency in the United States, we're also able to offer a wide range of services, not just on the military bases where Afghans are arriving, but in our 25 offices across the country. I'm also very pleased that our team in the UK is also ensuring that our experience is used for the benefits of Afghans arriving in the UK. Whatever you're able to do to support our appeal will be gratefully received and will go towards our services that make such a difference to Afghans at their hour of need. Thank you very, very much indeed for participating in this special concert, and thank you very much indeed for joining the IRC family. As troops began to leave Afghanistan, we spoke to teenage girls about their concerns for the future. The only thing that worries me are the old visions of Afghanistan from 20 years ago. I saw in the news that girls have already stopped going to school and coming out of their homes, and restrictions for women have started. Maybe a day will come that we will no longer go to school. And maybe our country will be like this darkness forever. One year ago, my class received a warning letter threatening to bomb my school. It said, if you do not close, we will attack the school and kill the girls. I feel like I cannot breathe in the moments when I think about this. 
My mother is illiterate. She couldn't go to school. And from that time to now, a lot has changed. Now girls are studying and going to college and university. And most of the women are doing jobs outside. But with the fighting increasing day by day, it's a concern that we will go back in time. I get scared when I think about what will happen to my future, my goals, and my dreams. Women and men, boys and girls, are equal in rights. Alone, vice cannot bend the future of Afghanistan. Since these interviews were recorded, the former Afghanistan government has been ousted from Kabul. Women and girls are calling to be heard. The International Rescue Committee will continue to support them no matter what. Donate now. of the girls of Afghanistan and to more music now and another instrument with strong links to the Middle East the flute and I'm delighted to say that we have with us tonight the internationally renowned flute player Wissam Ustani. Wissam was born and raised in the Lebanese capital Beirut. He came to the UK to study at the Royal Northern College of Music and is now based in London, where he plays with many of the capital's leading orchestras. To play Mozart's Flute Concerto No. 1, please welcome Wissam Ustani.
It's hard to think we've been deprived of live music for so long, isn't it? There really is nothing to touch live performance. And what a wonderfully spirited performance of Mozart's Flute Concerto No. 1 by Wissam Bustani. And there is lots more music to come in tonight's concert for Afghanistan, including one of Mozart's greatest symphonies in full. We will also hear first-hand accounts of music and musicians in Afghanistan, and we will try, with the help of an expert, to understand why music and musicians are now forbidden in Afghanistan. So take a short break, replenish your glass, and we will see you again soon.
Welcome back to part two of our concert for Afghanistan, keeping music alive for those in Afghanistan who cannot hear or play it and raising funds for the International Rescue Committee to help with their work on the ground in Afghanistan. But I want to introduce you now to one of our orchestral players. Actually, he's a lot more than that. This entire concert was his idea. He has worked tirelessly to make it happen. I'm not sure he ever sleeps. We've all become really used to emails and texts at two in the morning, three in the morning. Enrico Alvarez plays in the first violins. Come here, Enrico. Thank you. So tell me, first of all, Enrico, this yes. was your idea. What inspired you in the first place? Nine weeks ago, I was having a conversation with my wife, who's sitting right there next to David, Jury, um, Steph, and she had just seen the footage, news footage of people um, holding on to jet undercarriages in order to be able to be safe leave the country and be, you know, jet, j speeding jet undercarriage, that's safer than staying in your home. And this is powerful, you know. So, so anyway, it was actually, um, you don't know this, but it's actually, it was actually Steph's compassion towards that whole situation that overflowed into me and then into everybody else here and into you and out there, wherever you are on the internet. That's, it all started from that conversation, which is, which is a conversation probably many people were having, you know, what can we do to do this? Well, musicians do concerts, and they do this, and people come, and stuff happens, and it's not just the money that comes in, or there's all kinds of things. There's a ripple effect with these kind of things. This is what concerts are actually for. They're not, you know, cultural palace sort of things. They're, yeah. meant, they're socially engaged things. People come together. Uh, you know, this is why lockdown was so horrible for everybody. Yeah. That's anyway. a lovely way of describing no. what live music is all about. Obviously yeah. your first task was to put the orchestra together, yes. choose the music, but there was a lot more involved. I've seen yes. custom masks. There's oh, a program. Yes. You must yes. have a team behind you. Yes, yes I do. And prime amongst that is all of this stuff that you're seeing here, pretty much, is, all of it is down to one person. And her name is Ali Bradshaw, Alicia Bradshaw, and she deserves her applause. Where are you? Where is she? There. That's her. Now, Ali is 23 years old. And I guarantee you that if she was in charge of the world, <laughs> by next Wednesday, everything would be fine. <laughs> you're, you have to give her generation, Gen Z, no, that's right, yeah, Gen Z, they, they, you have to give them their head because they can do it. Look, this is her, pretty much. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> Enrico, I, yeah. I know you have a very personal story yes. about a certain person from Afghanistan. Yes. What happened to you in Frankfurt? Tell That's us the story. Right. So, one week after that conversation with Steph, I was working in Frankfurt and I needed to get a cab from the airport to the rehearsal place. And, um, that's Catherine. <laughs> um, so I had to get a, a taxi from the airport to the rehearsal space. And as fortune would have it, the cab driver was Afghan. So I told him about the concert and um, I made sure to get his name and his email address so that I could tell him to watch and that I would tell you what he said uh, and tell you his name. Because in many ways this concert is all about him and people like him. Um, I asked him about his time, his, how, his journey to uh, Germany, 
and how he found life in Germany and so on. And he said, to, he said something which was like listening to a, a poet. Because he said immediately, straight from the heart, he said, uh, uh, there is peace and there is work. And I thought, yeah, that's absolutely at the heart of this thing. That's what, so what could be more fundamental? When I told this story to Dr. Sarmast, he said immediately, said there is one other thing. There's peace, there's work. You must also have hope, which is what he is doing in uh, regenerating that school elsewhere. So people have hope. So yes, peace, uh, peace, work, and hope. So his name is Ahmad Zia Mosseni, and he is an Afghan working in Germany because he has to. Uh, he, can't, he can't be at home. So this concert is really for people like that. Lovely. And so on. Okay. Thank you, Enrique. Right. Thank you very much. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and if I, <laughs> if I could just add a personal note, many years ago, in fact, 40 years ago, when I was an ITN reporter for News at 10, I went to Afghanistan to cover the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Five times I went into the country, three of them with the Mujahideen from the northwest frontier province of Pakistan. We went through the Khyber Pass where there are names of British soldiers who lost their lives there nearly two centuries ago. And it occurred to me then, and it occurs to me even more now, when will the great powers learn that Afghanistan belongs to the Afghan people? Now, time for one of our distinguished soloists to make a second appearance. Please welcome back to play the oboe concerto in D minor by the Italian Baroque composer Benedetto Marcello Nicholas Daniel.
magnificent playing, if I might say so, of a fiendishly difficult instrument. Nicholas Daniel there, the soloist in Marcello's Oboe Concerto in D minor. I'm delighted now to welcome two eminent specialists who are very knowledgeable about music in Afghanistan in particular and South Asia in general. Mirwais Siddiqui is director of the Aga Khan Music Institute in Afghanistan and Dr. Catherine Schofield is senior lecturer at King's College London in music and Islam. Please welcome Mirwais and Catherine. Thank you both for being with us here tonight. Midwais, I'm going to start with you because I know you are in touch with fellow musicians and music educators in Afghanistan. What are you hearing from them? Well, uh, it's, it's sad stories that I'm hearing from them. Uh, last time I have uh, been in contact with one of the musicians, many of, but one of them, uh, explained to me from the Kuchi Kharabat, if you may know, because you have been in Afghanistan, the musician quarter of Afghanistan. Uh, he explained to me that, uh, I said, how is, how is life? He said, uh, they killed us, but there is no one to worry us. That's what he said. And are you in touch with them regularly? How easy is it to stay in touch with them? I'm in touch with them uh, via um, many different devices, uh, I mean, not devices, but uh, uh, applications, uh, in order not to be discovered. Yes. <laughs> uh, especially, I'm not uh, naming one, one of those uh, applications, but this is uh, yeah. more safe. And uh, they are in touch. We, I'm, I'm calling them daily, on a daily basis. And uh, lately, uh, there is another anecdote when other musicians told me, uh, I don't take the name be because of the security issues, uh, I don't name them. Uh, he said, uh, my son, he's five years old, he told me that, uh, Daddy, don't worry, I'm gonna get an ice cream machine and I will sell ice cream in the streets, and I give you one. Oh, sad story, Mirwais, thank you. Catherine, this is your area. You are an expert in this area. Something that has bewildered me from the moment I heard about it. What is it about music and musicians that upsets the Taliban? Yes, well, it's, it's basically about control. So all of us know that music is extraordinary, powerful uh, influence on our emotions, and especially live music. Um, and the risk is that uh, music might distract from God or from one's worldly duty. And many religions and ideologies have restricted music for these reasons. Uh, but for the Taliban, uh, they ban it completely. It doesn't matter if it's Western music or Afghan music. It doesn't matter if it's performed by women or men. It doesn't matter if it's got political lyrics or if it is just the sound of the rabab. They view the sound of music itself as morally corrupting and therefore all musicians as being morally degenerate. And the way to control this is to silence them. Is there any prospect of that changing? We've heard reports maybe the Taliban aren't the Taliban of 20 years ago. Is there any prospect of that changing? Well, the evidence I think speaks for itself. Two musicians have been executed one by the Taliban, one fleeing from the Taliban, uh, shot by border forces already, um, musical instruments being destroyed, people in hiding, uh, the radio and uh, television self-censoring, only playing very austere religious chants, which the Taliban do allow because they don't consider it to be music. Um, and uh, on the today's evidence, I don't think that there is much hope that they will allow musicians to continue. Mirwais, how can music then one day return to Afghanistan? Well, with the help of you, with the help of population who stand by the Afghan people, I hope one day we can bring that music back to Afghanistan. As John Bailey once said, how we can stop 
sing, bird singing. Impossible, yes. Well, we are with you on that, Mirwise. We certainly hope music will return to your country one day. Catherine, I know you have a lovely story to show us that music thrives and has always thrived in the world of Islam. Tell us your story about ragas and harpsichords. Okay, ragas and harpsichords. So there's a great story from 1788, which is the same year as the 40th symphony was composed by Mozart, and we're about to hear that. Um, and somewhere in North India, a musician writing in Persian wrote a treatise on rhythm. And he could have been an Afghan, because there were lots of Afghan musicians in North India at this point. We don't know. Um, and he had been given the opportunity to play the harpsichord and to hear Western instruments, because there were lots of East India Company people there. And he was incredibly enthusiastic about this instrument that he called that most fine and noble instrument, the harpsichord. And he played Indian ragas on the harpsichord, and he describes it at some length. But the best bit, I think, is that we know it was composed in 1788 because he gave us the date in the form of a chronogram, a poem which its syllables add up to the date. And this is the chronogram, and it's in Persian, but you'll understand it. Tanana, 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 flute, harp, violin, fife, organ, harpsichord. It's, it's lovely to have a little bit of humour amid yes. all the terrible news we're getting. Midwise, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And as Catherine said, that wonderful story of the ragas and the harpsichord come from the year 1788, which is the year that Mozart composed the symphony we are about to hear. And it is with this great symphony, Symphony No. 40, that we will end tonight's special concert for Afghanistan. In a matter of just six weeks, Mozart, in an extraordinary burst of creativity, completed three symphonies, his final three. This is the middle of the three, Symphony No. 40, and to conduct our special orchestra tonight in Mozart's Symphony No. 40, please welcome back David Murphy.
Mozart's glorious Symphony No. 40 in a magnificent performance by our specially assembled orchestra of musicians who represent tonight all British musicians and their solidarity with their fellow musicians in Afghanistan. And that, yes, why not? Congratulations. And that brings to a close our concert for Afghanistan, keeping music alive for a country where musicians, as we've heard tonight, now fear for their lives and raising much needed funds for the International Rescue Committee, which is carrying out such vital work on the ground. And if I may, I would like to remind you of how you can help us to help them. Here in the church, you can scan the QR code on the back of your program. 
There are also cash buckets here in the church. No coins, please, they're so heavy. <laughs> also, stewards with card machines do flag one down. If you're watching at home on social media, simply click the link in the description. If you're watching on the events platform, click the button. And I can tell you that tonight's concert has already raised more than £30,000, thanks to your... And we hope sincerely... We hope sincerely that you have enjoyed tonight's concert for Afghanistan. From me, John Suchet, our musicians, our soloists, our conductor, David Murphy, and our special guests, Catherine and Mirweiss. Thank you, and thank you for coming, and thank you for supporting our concert for Afghanistan. Thank you.